Palmitylation is one of several covalent lipid modifications of proteins. Although palmitate can be attached to proteins in several ways, the most common is through a thioester linkage to cysteine residues. The fatty acid modification is often referred to as palmitylation, but it's not limited to palmitate. Other fatty acids are known to be thioesterified to proteins. This modification is post-translational, and it occurs on membranes in many different compartments, the Golgi, the plasma membrane, endoplasmic reticulum. It can be stable or reversible, and it's found on peripheral and integral membrane proteins. Over 400 proteins are modified in mammalian cells, and this is probably an underestimate. The arising of multiple methods to do palmital proteomics has really expanded the list of palmitylated proteins, and I anticipate that this will continue to grow. Most proteins on the cytoplasmic face of membranes are palmitylated by members of a family of enzymes called DHHC proteins, where the DHHC stands for ASP, HIS, HIS, CIS, which is a four amino acid motif that's embedded in a cysteine-rich domain of the protein. Now, the DHHC family of palmitol transferases were really only discovered in 2002, so we're in the first decade of the DHHC PAT family. Palmetal transferases are often called uh, PATs, which is short for protein acyl transferases. So the breakthrough in this field came from the discovery of, from a genetic screen that Robert Deshane did in his lab then at the University of Iowa. And he was studying the yeast RAS protein, which is covalently modified with lipids quite similar to what mammalian H and N RAS are, are modified. So these proteins are first farnesylated, and then they are proteolized and methylated, giving a modified carboxy terminus. And then upstream of that farnesylated carboxy terminus is a cysteine residue that becomes modified. Bob set up a clever genetic screen in which he created an allele of RAS that required palmitylation for survival of the organism. And he pulled out two genes, ERF2 and ERF4. These gene products form a protein complex in the endoplasmic reticulum. In their absence, RAS palmitylation is reduced and RAS is mislocalized to intracellular membranes. Working with Bob's lab, my laboratory, we showed that the ERF2, ERF4 complex was able to palmitylase RAS in vitro, and that palmitylation was dependent on the presence of both of the gene products, ERF2 and ERF4, and that mutations within this DHHC domain that was present in ERF2 were required for the PAD activity. So this was an exciting breakthrough in terms of identifying the RAS palmital transferase. In independent work, Nick Davis, then at Wayne State University, showed that another protein with DHHC cysteine-rich domain, AKR1, was capable of palmitylating substrate yeast, yeast casing kinase 2. And what ERF2 and AKR1 had in common was this DHHC cysteine-rich domain, suggesting that it was a palmital transferase domain. Both proteins are integral membrane proteins. One thing that sets them apart is that ERF2 requires a second binding partner protein called ERF4. And interestingly, ERF4 had been identified in a prior screen studying RAS function and was named SHR5, and that protein was um, linked to RAS palmitylation, but it was, the mechanism was never determined. And that was work that was done by Scott Powers' group. So now that we have both the first two palmitol transferases and we know the features that define a palmitol transferase, integral membrane proteins that harbor a DHHC cysteine-rich domain, it was easy to go into genomic databases and find that these, there was a large family of enzymes that were present in many karyotic organisms. There are 23 DHHC proteins in humans and likely 24 in mice. My laboratory has been very interested in the mechanism of DHHC proteins, and it was known that the DHHC proteins become palmitylated during the reaction as well as their substrate. So if we incubated D DHHC3, a human DHHC protein, with meristylated G-alpha I, we could see that there was incorporation of palmitate into the enzyme in the presence or absence of substrate as well as incorporation of palmitate into the substrate. 
if we use the catalytically inactive DHH S mutant, where we change that cysteine, key cysteine residue to serine, this blocked both autoacylation and the palmitylation of the substrate, leading to the hypothesis that DHHC proteins use an acyl enzyme intermediate. To test this directly, my student Ben Jennings did what's called a single turnover experiment, where he purified radio-labeled DHHC3 that was labeled with tritiated palmitate, and then removed all free palmitate coenzyme A. And then when he incubated that, in the presence of meristylated G-alpha I1, he could see that there was a time-dependent transfer of the radio label from the enzyme onto the substrate, and that the rate of appearance of palmitate on the substrate paralleled the rate of loss of palmitate from the enzyme. This was direct evidence, then, that the enzyme was forming an acyl enzyme intermediate, and that it was the palmitate on the enzyme that was being transferred to the substrate.